Welcome to the Brain Trust, hosted by Edgeway United Synagogue. It will follow the original format in which a panel of experts attempt to answer questions submitted by you, the audience. They will be read out to the panelists who have not had sight of them, and the responses will therefore be totally unrehearsed and unscripted. I am Spencer Nathan, and I shall be acting as your chairman tonight. I follow in the shadow of such well-known figures as Malcolm Muggeridge and Gilbert Harding, though I hasten to add that I have nothing in common with either. The former, since I'm not an agnostic who has converted to Christianity, and anyway, I rather like Monty Python's Knife of Brian. The latter, since I don't consider myself irascible, have never been described as the rudest man in Britain, and I'm sure that I'm not half as grumpy as he was. Our expert panel tonight has been carefully chosen to include the fields of finance, religion, medicine and law. And I'm quite certain that with such distinguished participants, I don't have to ask them to memorise person, woman, man, camera and TV, both at the beginning and at the end of the session. Alyssa Baer is, is Senior Investment Director at Investec Wealth and Investment UK and in the 1980s was one of the first women on, of the stock exchange. She frequently appears on TV and radio, commenting on the financial world. Rabbi Andrew Shaw is the Chief Executive of Mizrahi UK and was the founder of the United Synagogues Tribe and was Director of its Living and Learning Department. In more normal times, he runs the regular Shabbat service in our shul. Irving Taylor is the Emeritus Professor of Surgery, Division of Surgery and Interventional Sciences at University College London Medical School and is past president of the European Society of Surgical Oncology. He is the author and editor of some 29 books and has published over 600 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He gave a well-received lecture on Maimonides, the physician, in our adult education program some time ago. Howard Youngwood is a former assistant chief crown prosecutor in London from 1993 to 1996 and a retired immigration judge. He too has had a session in our adult education program discussing his involvement in the Stephen Lawrence case. I shall ask each questioner to read out their question in an identical form to that sent to me. And so to our first question, which comes from Stephen Finer. Annexation or no annexation? That is the question. And more particularly, if Israel goes ahead to annex, does it serve her long-term interest both in the region and the world? Andrew, would you like to start with that? That's not an easy one, I guess. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me this evening. I'm currently on holiday here in Manchester. I mean, this question is obviously an interesting one, but also it, it goes down to so many of the questions about Israel. Um, how do we, or do we, in the diaspora, have the, not the, of course we have opinion on it, but in terms of who decides these things, and very much I've found for many years, one of the frustrating things is that people here in the uh, diaspora very much seem to have been very angry at the Israeli politicians, and that's great, and you're allowed to be, um, but not realizing that the Israeli politicians are doing what they're doing because they've been voted in by the electorate. And I think so with annexation. I think we can get a bit uh, sort of, what's the word, overhyped about it. I think certainly the uh, original plan that uh, the government had was very much just to do what was being sort of normalized over the last 30, 30 years with different governments, never got around to doing it, which is to make sure that the, uh, the areas that are very heavily populated with Jewish um, settlements and Jewish uh, towns, villages, should be part of Israel. Certainly at the moment, it's always difficult. And I'm certainly no expert in the geopolitical affairs to know whether or not this is the right time to do it. But I think on the bigger picture, I am very wary of any peace process with the, uh, the Palestinians. I was so excited in 1993 when they stood in the White Horse lawn. And I believe, and maybe here was the chance, the last 25 years have shown me clearly Israel at the moment does not have a part of the peace, and therefore maybe annexation is a way of saying this is a way to force hand to say we don't believe there is a way forward unless we actually strengthen ourselves even more. And you could argue that so many times Israel has taken the other way. Let's leave Gaza, let's leave the, let's leave uh, sort of parts of Lebanon in order to sort of make peace. Both of those decisions ended in war and bloodshed and terror. So I guess I can understand why Israel wants to go down this road. As I said, no expert to know whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. But certainly I have faith in the Israeli electrical system, if that's an actual, might be not so wrong, faith in the Israeli electrical system. But certainly I think that Israel has a right to decide this, and I hope 
that it works out well for both the Jewish people in Israel and, of course, the wider Arab uh, world as well. Howard, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, um, it's difficult to be short about this because it's such an emotive subject. I think we've got to divide it into two. Is annexation or can annexation properly understood be justified? And secondly, if so, uh, should it now take place? You will probably be aware that many hundreds of very, very high level esteemed judges sent a letter to the newspapers a few weeks ago, basically saying annexation is illegal. Now, we haven't got all evening to discuss that. But what worries me as a lawyer, I should stress as a lawyer who's not an international lawyer, very few lawyers are international lawyers. But when high level judges use the term annexation, we're not talking about an house annex, they must be judged on the technical and indeed legal meaning of annexation. And you don't need, in my view, to be a high level lawyer to realize that annexation means something hostile. And in fact, if you look at the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, annexation is the use of force to acquire the territory of another state. It is considered a grave crime of aggression. We haven't got time to talk about offensive or defensive wars, but uh, certainly one, most of us will take the view that nearly all, all of Israel's wars are essentially defensive. But acquiring the territory of another state is not what this question is really about, whether or not it's good uh, or a bad idea. One's got to go back briefly, Spencer, to the original mandate for Palestine, remembering, of course, that France also got a mandate by which the Arab countries acquired vast tracts of territory for their states. The first legal justification, because we're talking, I'm afraid, boring legalities, the first legal justification for the rights of Jews to a homeland was not the Balfour Declaration, that was just an expression of good intent. It was the San Remo Treaty in 1920, which first gave a legal right to the Jewish people to have a homeland in Palestine. And that legal right was reinforced by Article 80 of the United Nations Charter, which brought forward effectively all the rights secured by the rights of the League of Nations. Now, in 1920, we've also got to remember that what the Allies inherited was not a country called Palestine, but I think three separate administrative areas administered by the Ottoman Empire, extending from the Mediterranean right up to now what is Iraq and Saudi Arabia. There were three different administrative areas. And when this 1920 San Remo Treaty gave the right to settle or make a homeland to the Jews in Palestine, it is arguable that, that would extend to all those three administrative areas. Now, as we know, that was not to be, but it's important to realize how it came that it was not to be when Jordan, formerly Transjordan, was given about 76 or 77 percent of that mandate territory, because the treaty defining the mandate uh, territory in Article 25, I recall, entitled Britain to request a change in the terms, and I remember the quote here, in the territories east of the Jordan and the eastern boundary of Palestine. We're talking about Palestine. And as you know, uh, Britain requested that Jews would not be allowed any rights of uh, homelands in what is 76 or 77 percent of their mandate. So just taking that as a starter, we can see that annexation is not only a legal term, but it really is very difficult to apply. The only other thing I'll say, rather than hogging the joint, it's very, very important, because what's argued about annexation and the, the settlement is uh, Article 49 of the Geneva Convention. That's always thrown against us. That, however, in its original form, applies to deportation or transfer of population, emulating what the Germans did uh, during and after the war. Well, the Israelis, whatever their thoughts, are not deporting or transferring their own population. The population, rightly or wrongly, that's to be argued, have decided that many of them actually want to live in what we call Judea and Samaria, what's known as the West Bank. And also, it must be said, Jews did own property in the Ottoman Empire. They were kicked out by the Jordanians, but they actually previously owned property there. So putting that all together very, very briefly, annexation is not the right term for what Israel wants to do. Is it a good idea? 
Well, I'll just provoke everybody by saying at the moment, I think it would be a very, very bad idea because the background is Netanyahu. And speaking as someone who, broadly speaking, is a moderate right winger, uh, I don't trust Netanyahu at one moment. If he decides upon annexation, you can be pretty sure it's not for the right reason. It is for self-preservation. It is because of the corruption trial. It would do nothing but harm. But we first of all have to ask, as I say, is it justified? I think arguably it is. And you perhaps need to have a full legal argument with lawyers on the other side. Should it be done now? No way. Alyssa, would you like to say something? <laughs> well, I think I go back to Andrew Shaw's view that do the diaspora have a right to say what should happen in Israel? And I think when Mark Regev, the um, outgoing ambassador, came to the court of St. James, he very much said he is the ambassador to Israel. And he found it, I suppose, a little unusual that so many English Jews had opinions which actually might differ to from what he thought or what Israel wanted. And the problem is with this that virtually everybody you speak to has a view. But actually, it remains up to um, Mr. Netanyahu and can he keep his government going forward, which is a bit more difficult, and will he at the end get what he wants? Whether actually we like it or not, I think is a different matter. And I also think, though, what I, the Israeli government has forgotten, that perhaps what happens, well, certainly what happens in Israel does affect the diaspora. The amount of criticism that's come from English jury or certain elements of English jury may be unhelpful. But on the other hand, I think Israel feels that English jury may not matter. And actually, in certain cases, they do matter and they give money to Israel. And that ought to be remembered, which is why they can have a view. It shouldn't affect anything. It won't affect anything. But on the other hand, they shouldn't discount our views entirely. Well, just very briefly, I, I would not in any way comment on the legal aspects, other than to say that I was persuaded by Natasha Hausdorff, who spoke uh, two or three weeks ago here and also wrote in the JC. And she made a very cogent argu argument, as far as I'm concerned, that there was, in the, the actual term annexation is a misnomer. Uh, and she gave a number of legal reasons why that was was so. And in fact, she argued very strongly that it wasn't, in fact, in violation of international law. But that, of course, is an opinion which is based entirely on, on the legal aspect. The only other point I would like to make is that I think one's got to consider the risks involved uh, if Israel pursued this policy. And, and there are risks involved. Uh, I mean, the, the problems with the borders is obviously crucial and uh, could involve years of further discomfort. But we have to remember that this this is a unstable situation in terms of our relationships, particularly with Jordan. Uh, and uh, this could be it could be harmed. And also now that we're having such good relations, or at least Israel is having such good relationship with the Gulf states, again this could be impacted. So that there is a cost uh, to this and the risk of benefits analysis has to be looked at very carefully. But uh, as far as the question of international law is concerned, I still find it confusing, but I'm persuaded that it may not well may not be in breach of, of international law. Susan Taylor. I was going to say, what does the team think of patients seeing GPs via video link as opposed to personal uh, consultations? And slightly wider than that, we do have a question whether the NHS can continue to exist as a free at the point of delivery organisation. So if you can answer Susan's question and maybe expand it to the second one. Uh, Irving, I think you could start with that one. I have actually, I've got to confess a conflict of interest, simply because that I've spent 52 years of my life working within the NHS and uh, in fact continue to work, although albeit in a teaching capacity, I'm, I'm not actively involved in surgical practice anymore. So I do have a great uh, love of the NHS. Yes. And although I recognise, obviously, there are problems when you're trying to provide top-class treat treatment to 68 million uh, people at a cost which is uh, below that you would expect uh, on the basis of uh, GDP. Nevertheless, I think uh, the, the service provided, and in fact, despite all the criticisms relating to the latest COVID crisis, nevertheless, I think... Uh, there are aspects of the NHS which are clearly essential to retain and hopefully improve. I think there are two parts to the question. I think uh, in terms, uh, and I will be very, very brief, obviously we could discuss this for a long time, but to be very, very brief, um, the, the model for the delivery of healthcare to different 
to large populations is different in different countries. And uh, the idea of providing care at the point, uh, the point of need uh, without worrying about uh, financial aspects, I think is still a principle which we should do, all, do our best to maintain. But there will have to be alteration in the way that uh, care is delivered. And if, if anything, the uh, one aspect of the COVID crisis has demonstrated that there are there is a need to reorganise the way in which care is delivered. And there are a number of suggestions and a number of uh, discussions I know taking place at the highest level that when we do eventually get back to normal, that there will need to be major uh, consideration given to altering uh, the type of service that is, is provided. As far as video conference is concerned, that is just one example of the need for alteration that will have to come about as we uh, accept uh, the, the, the different uh, environment um, that exists at the moment. And although I personally have not been involved because I'm no longer in practice, nevertheless, I, I, I see what is going on at University College, for example, because I'm actually one of the governors on the board there. And I must say, from the views being expressed by the chief executive and other people who are in, intimately involved on the ground, video uh, conferencing and uh, online opinion giving, um, I think is here to stay. Again, modifications and how it's divided and how it's going to be triaged are things to be discussed. But it's quite clear that if you want to look at any uh, changes, long-term changes which have occurred as a result of the latest crisis. This is just one example of the way that healthcare is going to be delivered will change uh, in the future and hopefully for the better. Listen, would you like to come in on that and particularly on the financial <laughs> side? <laughs> well, partly the financial side and also the fact that I'm married to a former GP. Yes. And when he retired some five or six years ago, there were a um, it was actually parties given by the patients and they started to talk about my doctor and at that stage I didn't go to the doctor so much and certainly not the GP and I was very struck by this and I think one of the things that is changing today and it's changing for everybody that you're being told that online consultations are the way forward and actually you need to decide who is it better for. What you're not getting is continuity of care and the doctor who can see you you can have lots of things on Zoom and you can have something like this and it's all fine. If actually you need to um, talk to a patient and you've known them for many years, I think you need the understanding of that particular patient and also to realise that actually somebody might be ringing you up or talking about something that actually is not what's on their mind and they need to do something else. If you no longer know the doctor and you don't have proper contact, I think personally it's not a plus going forward. But I think everything that has happened as a part of the virus means lots of things are going digital. But as I would say, I don't think it makes it better. It just makes it different. Those of us who are older will have to get used to different, but you don't have to like it. But I think particularly at times in medicine, the seeing somebody, the knowing somebody is important. So I don't actually think it's a great step forward. Andrew? Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, I could. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase in halakha, something that is bidiyavad, which is, you know, after the effect of the chadkhila, ideally. And there's no question for me, uh, ideally you want to have the doctor-patient relationship face-to-face. -face. You cannot diagnose certain things off a screen. And, and in fact, take it into the rabbinical world, you know, rabbis are seeing their congregants on Zoom. The reason we're doing it now is because we have to. There's another way we can do it because of the world we're in at the moment. And therefore, once hopefully we can come out of this a bit, there's no question conferences or, or using Zoom for, um, for seeing patients could be a very good thing in terms of the first stage of something. Like, you know, whether to, you don't have to overwhelm the doctor with so many people coming to surgery, a few could be seen by the Zoom link or by the consultation and could be sorted out. But we have to really understand, that, as was just said by Elisa, it's so important that there is this doctor-patient relationship, that there is a real connection made between doctor they, think that they know each other, especially as they get older, and there's, there's, there's complications. I think therefore we've got to realise, yes, room and it might be occasionally need to be used, uh, but I would really hope we can go back to the world, and I think it is a much better world, of actual face-to-face -face, uh, consultations, because that's really where the care happens, not just on a, a doctor-patient level, but on any level of any pastoral work in the world. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think video co the video consultation is here to stay whether we like it or not. Um, with some uh, exceptions, I am not a happy at all. To bring the level right down, I'm sorry, uh, the, the joke a few weeks ago summed it up for me. The fellow was told by his wife, you've got your video consultation. He said, no way am I showing everyone my hemorrhoids. I mean, that, that sums up, you know, the actual the actual threat we have. And what Irving put uh, academically, um, uh, the real thing, the, the, the NHS is so beloved, it's so precious to all of us with all it supports that there's no way it's going to disappear barring extraordinary uh, manifestations. The layman, I suppose, wonders, can we carry on as before? Where can we make savings? And each time I've gone down that path, I've had to beat a hasty retreat. So if you think about do people who gorge themselves uh, on an unhealthy diet deserve to be treated on the NHS, well, perhaps they don't, but ultimately I'm persuaded there's probably no ultimate saving if you don't treat them initially because they're going to come back later in a far worse condition and the same with drink and other unhealthy styles so that's a huge question which uh, the government and medical people have to sort out for the future i'll read out uh, martin brown's question uh, from the perspective of the specialities of each member of the panel how do they see the state of the uk in a post-covid britain there's another fairly similar one in your own field of expertise, how different will the world look in five years' time compared to where it would have been before COVID? Well, if, if, if you're all shy, um, <laughs> um, the state of the UK, well, I haven't got my crystal ball with me, and I'm not sure if Andrew would have approved if I used it. I mean, we, we are very good at getting into a mess. I mean, history, the, the Brits get into a mess with phenomenal competence and ease, and we have in the past always got out of that mess. So whether we're talking about a, a V-shaped recovery or not, I, I think we will recover, but it's no good deluding ourselves. There are aspects of society which are in a very, very bad uh, bad frame. Um, and it's interesting, um, not as a historian, but someone who just is old enough to be aware of things. It was 1942, wasn't it, that uh, the war government, the coalition government led by the Tories, introduced the Beveridge Report, a major document which marked our future. We've at least got the possibility, do we not, of um, Boris, whatever you think of him, being responsible for changing uh, to a material degree, uh, what Tory governments previously did uh, as a matter of reality. So, for instance, um, the extent to which now we should go back to being self-reliant. Uh, the economic cost is a matter perhaps for you, Elisa, but there are strong arguments, aren't there? We just cannot carry on reliance upon China or other, other people. We've got to be more self-reliant. And uh, if that involves discussions of what proportion of um, debt our GDP should be, okay, that's a, a discussion to be had. But we can, and I think to some extent, can be optimistic that we will transform society for the better by being more self-reliant, by having more sense of civic responsibility, more aware of key workers, uh, and all those things. It's not optimism, but I hope based on some system of reality. Because we've got a government which um, I think, I think could, could bring home the bring home the bacon to use an appropriate term. Yeah. Could I just follow that up, uh, Spencer? If you're asking for volunteers, uh, because I, I think in all uh, events such as we've been going through uh, this time, one really has got to learn lessons. I think it's a horrible phrase to use, but we've got to learn lessons. And I've been thinking about this over the last few weeks, like many people have, and I've noticed there are changes which I think will definitely occur as a direct result of COVID. Uh, uh, most of them are social changes. We don't see any rough sleepers on the on the streets anymore. If you go down Tottenham Court Road, uh, there's hardly, a, in fact, there are no rough street sleepers because they've now found housing for them all and hospitals for them. I think we're now beginning to realise what the term a key worker is. Because key workers have been shown to be shop assistants, bus drivers, refuse collectors and care workers. These are very important key workers. And yet they're individuals who are the most poorly paid members of society with very, very little status. But it was shown quite clearly that they really are important people. Another thing which has been shown, which I think has to improve, is the social care aspect. We must reorganise social care in this country to look after the most vulnerable people. Because at present, the social care aspects are really not fit for purpose. Care homes need to be looked at. 
The majority of care homes in this country are all private. They're very poorly understood, poorly staffed, again, uh, managed by poorly paid people. The other thing that's been shown, and I think, again, needs to be looked at uh, in detail and must change, is this whole question, the social determinants of health. There are people who do not benefit and are, their health environment is significantly uh, uh, adversely affected because they're in, not in a position uh, to afford proper social living. I'm talking, and this has been shown that people in various uh, uh, housing developments have done very badly as far as the disease is concerned, the BAME population, very badly as far as uh, prognosis is concerned. And finally, I, I think that th there is a need for society to mm. not ignore uh, the changes which have been brought about by COVID in, a, on a t in terms of a social basis, uh, and these things will alter, I'm sure. We've mentioned about the N NHS previously, and I'm absolutely certain massive changes will occur in the NHS. As far as video conferencing, that's just one aspect. And as people have mentioned before, it's obviously got to be triaged. Not everybody's going to be suitable for an audio-visual consultation, but some people are, and there's sort of stage one, stage two, and stage three. So I, I think we have to look at the social, in, the huge inequality in social care within this country. And again, I mean, people, I've heard it often stated that we're the fifth wealthiest country in the world, and yet this uh, COVID problem has revealed some of the great inequalities in our society, and these must, and I'm sure, will be looked at in, in due course. Can I take it a little bit differently? When I understood the question, we're talking to our specialities, meaning how do I, as a rabbi, see the UK Jewishly? And that's kind of how I saw the question, which I thought was interesting. Um, and for me, um, Corona has done something very, I hope, positive. In a positive way. What do I mean by, by that? What do we see? Um, with the outbreak, that our communal structures were closed down. Uh, we didn't have shul, we didn't have schools, we didn't have youth movement, we had nothing. All we actually had left were the Jewish homes. And one of the biggest problems, Jewishly, for the last generation, or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe more, um, is that the so many people outsource their Jewish child's education to the school, to the youth movement, to the average organization, whereas really where is the heartbeat of the Jewish religion is the Jewish home. And I'm hopeful that so many families, especially those with younger children, have spent so much more time at home. I've spoken to a lot of my friends who've said it's been so lovely. They've had Friday night dinner um, with, the, uh, with, the, with their children. They've actually spent time with them. Some, some parents have learned with their kids. It's really allowed Judaism to become a home-centered religion once again, which it always should have been. Uh, certainly growing up uh, in Kingsbury, that to me was, was always the, the core place where everything took place. And yet with the advent of Jewish schools and other things, we kind of moved away from the home and really into some sort of education coming from outside the home. And that's a real tragedy. And I'm hopeful, therefore, that maybe even after we go back and our schools are returning and schools are returning, which is great, the parents will realize they still have to continue their fantastic work they did during lockdown, to maintain and to show Judaism as alive and well in their homes um, and for their children. So to me, that's uh, one other thing which I think is interesting. Uh, COVID has told shuls they've got to cut their shul services down, make them as short as possible. Boach Hashem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so ridiculous that we have three-hour services. I don't know, anyone under certain age, I don't know how they... they, they, they I mean, I don't want it. Um, I mean, I always try to go to Israel. It's so lovely to go to a shul. You can be out by 9.30. It starts at 8, done by 9.30. Loving is beautiful, so and so forth. And in a way, you know, maybe this is the thing. I mean, what's quite amusing for me is Diane Binstock passed the whole thing to all U.S. rabbis about this is what you have for Rosh Hashanah. You can do the bare minimum. I've been doing the bare minimum for years in Stanford well, because it's inspiring because you can focus on the major prayers and not have to go through so many computers that no one actually can understand or care about. So in some ways, that's a benefit. Hopefully, in five years' time, I know you will actually be more hope centered and she'll be actually quicker and more vibrant and more emotionally sort of charged. Before I bring Alyssa in, could I um, ask you um, to answer the, uh, this follow up question? Um, have Zoom and the social media 
created a permanent environment through home viewing where men and women will continue to pray together unsegregated. <laughs> Is that my question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, as I said, I think it's, look, there's no question, again, I'm coming from models, but I think the role of women in Judaism in shul is the most important thing. I know, again, in Stanmore, when I created what, we, what we're now doing everywhere, at the Limburg service um, in Stanmore, which became MMET, I made it very clear that the Mechita goes down the middle, it's removed when I'm giving a drusha, it's removed when anyone's giving a drusha, male or female, because we cannot make our women feel part of the community. And also, the, the point being made is that people at the moment are watching a couple of Shabbos um, together as a family unit, and they, they're but getting used to watching these. They, they can still watch it together as a unit, just sitting on different sides of the Mechita when they go back to the show. But no, I understand. It's, 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 it's so important. And again, to me, um, you know, I, I think the idea of set, you know, sitting separately in a, in a house of worship, I think is so powerful and makes me really focused. But at the same time, it doesn't stop us realizing that it's fantastic how many women have come to Shul in the morning now. How many women have come to Kabbalah Shabbat? We've got to make sure they feel, you know, there's many Shul that are out there. If a woman comes to Shul in the morning, she can't sit anywhere. There's no, there's no other way to sit. So these sort of things, again, we have to start thinking, how can we make sure that if 25 women are coming to Shachwit, I don't know if that's true, in a certain Shul, how can you mention when we return to shul, they still want to come to shul. And that's a challenge for the rabbis, a challenge for the community, but it's so important that it's done properly, uh, engaging people, but obviously within the, the uh, halakha world. Right, Alyssa, um, could you come back to the original question? Yes, I, I think that, that's very interesting. First of all, um, I don't think I've quite got the view that everybody else has, um, because the work that I do, the investment work and what's going on, uh, may give me a more depressing view, I don't know. But I certainly think you can't say what could happen in five years because I think that's impossible. But I think in the short term, I've, on a global basis, one has never seen any, no, that this is dramatic. And the supporting so many millions of people and giving them money, which is due to stop fairly soon, they are, in my opinion, very much at the beginning with definite redundancies and loss of jobs in the retail sector. The retail sector in this country was having problems anyway. Certain sectors that have been under pressure, you can already see it, but actually ever get back to where we were. Oh, right. The um, public are going to have a problem. I think the government was extremely successful in locking people down, but the problem now is getting them back because I think they've frightened people to such an extent. I think we're going to have to look at our public transport system to make life better. But I think in terms of economics, we have got debt all around the world, um, governments who are having to support people. And we've done, I think, not a bad job on that. But after October, when furlough stops, I think, unfortunately, one is going to see a situation that we've never seen. It may well cause social unrest. I think um, uh, the rabbi is correct. As a community, generally, I think people have been great, but I think it's going to require a lot more than that going forward. Lots of people, for example, who have investments, maybe, you know, not the most wealthy, everybody thinks they are, but they're not, but have been relying on dividends. A terrific amount of companies, over 60% have cut their dividends. What are people going to live on? You've also got now your children with schools, with university. Everything has changed. So I would say that certainly, never mind a five-year view, the next 12 months are going to be absolutely vital in terms of industries, how people are going to survive, are they going to have jobs, and how we're going to manage longer term. So at the moment, I think there is an awful lot to think about. There's lots of things like food banks that never were there before, and it isn't only people who needed them before. You've suddenly got professional, self-employed people going to food banks, which never happened. So I think there's a lot happening, and a lot of it is not very attractive. Is Vicky Green there? Vicky. Yeah, I'm here. I'll read one out for you. Um, which individual has had the most influence on your life? Okay, I, mean, I guess I, I'll, go, I'll go first on this one. Um, it's actually a hard one because I feel very blessed that so many people, I'm sure we all, we all can say that. Um, and I'm going to probably be quite corny, uh, but I think it's very true, which is it's my mother has probably had the most influence on my life in so many reasons. Um, firstly, that she prioritised education um, as the most important thing to give to her children uh, and made sure that uh, I was able to go to a top secondary school. Um, uh, I think it still is a top secondary school. Um, and, and therefore that would kind of bred in me a real love for education, real love for, for 
of sort of pushing myself forward, I think it's so important. And again, we can we can argue the pros and cons of various schools, but I think if you can give a child a real sense of you can achieve and you can you can really challenge yourself at uh, that age, I think it, it, it's phenomenal. Um, but I think those who know my mum and some of this group will know uh, she's overcome tremendous challenges uh, and has never said that uh, anything is too much for her. She's always carried on going in a remarkable way. Uh, and certainly as a rabbi working in the field, you've really got to have that sense of I'm going to just keep going because a lot of things in the community can really try and drive you off and, and, and sort of uh, give you a sense of what's the point in carrying on. So I think she's really been a role model for me in terms of understanding that as a, as a human being, as a Jewish person, and as a professional, you've got to always give it your best and always make sure that you are not sort of giving in to the easy way out and, and putting the struggle in. And you say the fun sour agro calls the effort comes reward. And very much that's what I was shown in my home growing up uh, through school, my school and, and onwards, even to this day, uh, the way I see her living her, her wonderful life. And please God, I'm there best. Well, the politically correct question, chaps, is obviously it's obviously one's wife, isn't it? Uh, Andrew, you should know better. But uh, I mean, one's <laughs> wife, the, the dear creatures hovering nearby in the sense of influencing <laughs> to raise your aspirations, to aim high. Um, and I've been annoying her for 49 years. It seems to have worked. But there's a serious point which I can resonate with Andrew. Um, one of the very loveliest passages in, in the Fomash that I recall is the straight, well, the apparently strange order of words when you remember that Isaac meets Rebecca. And I can't remember it by heart, Andrew, correctly. But when they finally, uh, get together, there's a sort of three part phrase when it says Isaac, I think, took Rebecca, uh, made her his wife, and loved her, and the rabbis all get onto the bandwagon and say it's a rather odd order of events. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be pertinent to COVID, because in today's society, with some honourable exceptions, it's full of romance or lust or whatever you want, but uh, true love, uh, I, I would query. Uh, divorces are, you know, to a penny, they, they, they happen. Uh, relationships without marriage are, are common. And COVID has, in a sense, uh, for better, uh, given couples a chance to give a bit more time for each other, to uh, reinvigorate relationships, to be grateful for the little things, just to have time together, even if they seem rather petty. So that's the political answer. But Andrew also sees a, a very good point, Jewish mothers. You know, I've been studying a lot of Jewish literature and uh, Holocaust uh, literature, and they you sometimes say, am I really interested in yet another story of heroism? And almost inevitably, the answer is yes, because you read about another remarkable um, hero, usually a, a matriarch, and you realize they're not unique in the sense of being unique individuals when you're being truly honest about it, but they come from a unique generation who had the most appalling um, uh, obstacles in their way, uh, brought up their families, supported us, drove us mad sometimes, but they ultimately, I think that must be the answer, the true heroines are most Jewish mothers. <laughs> I, think Oscar, I think Oscar Wilde said divorce is a made in heaven. Irving, would you like to come in on the question? Well, uh, two people had a great influence. Uh, I'll exclude parents just for the moment. I have to mention my wife, Berry, who's been crazy enough to follow me up and down the country for the last 51 years. Um, and there's always been a tremendous support, and that in itself has been a great influence. Uh, there's also a chap um, who nobody will have heard of, I don't think, a chap called Bert Duffy, who when I was a very young, very innocent, very green, newly qualified doctor, uh, took me by the hand and uh, gave me advice, which I won't tell you just at the moment, but uh, had a huge uh, part to play in, in the remainder of uh, uh, my own life. Um, and I'll add my It's actually my 46th wedding anniversary today. So this is what I'm going to celebrate it all with you. Well, so I, <laughs> I make my tribute to my, my husband. But I think in my case, I would say it was my upbringing, my parents. My mother was um, training to be a barrister before she got married. But I think what happened when I and I have two sisters, I think it was the confidence at that stage to believe why couldn't you do something. So that when I started in the city, there were very few women, there were very few Jews, there were certain firms that wouldn't allow you in because you were Jewish, let alone because you were a woman. Um, being on, one of the, I was on the stock exchange floor when there were very few women. And I think it was that belief. They, 
that you couldn't, I couldn't see, and it's kept me going all my life. Those of you who know me uh, will know very much that actually, why shouldn't I do something? And I think particularly with women, and I still think it's the case today, a lot of people feel in the field of education still, you know, I will do it for my son, less now, but not so much for my daughter. And I honestly think that a belief that, uh, a parental belief that you can do, you can give your children that confidence to be able to do what they want to do and to achieve, I think is something that we can all look to and to the following generations. It's very important and you get it the other way where somebody feels about somebody, they, they can't do something or will never come to anything and it's not worth it. The answer is if you instill the right confidence, I think it's a terrific benefit. Thank you. Jane, would you like to ask your question on a day when all the talk is about examination results? Yes, um, I was curious to ask you whether you felt that a, um, a child at this post A level stage would be better going to university or taking up an apprenticeship and not having uh, being saddled with debt three years down the line. What would you do? I know lots of things, rude things were said about the old polytechnics becoming universities years ago. Look, I don't think any of us uh, are probably experts on this, so just giving you intuitive responses. Um, can't give a 100% view. There are people who are born to academia and are justified in aiming for courses which are best given at academia. And there are other people who, frankly, can anticipate earning a pretty good living by uh, going to what's... Uh, used to be called, I don't know, whatever they call called, but they're taking some sort of apprenticeship and a training because we do need uh, skilled people. I remember when having lots of phenomenally um, uh, excited conversations with my excellent builder. When we came to our flats in Edra a year and a half ago, we gutted it, and we had this excellent Polish builder who was an absolute academic in a sense. He didn't have television. He knew more about Brexit than I did, in fact, most people. And we got into really sort of very, very excited conversations. And he was saying at that time, uh, I hope he's wrong, basically you can forget in the future post-Brexit having any real skilled workmen, once the English have died out, uh, all the poles are going back, etc., etc., as a rather grim foreboding. So that emphasises the need for really skilled, skilled tradesmen. Um, as for debt, I have no uh, uh, answer on that. Um, you take your chances. You, you can't, it's no longer, um, you can't any longer expect to be permanently um, assisted by the government. Lord knows the debt we've got into at the moment. So, Subject but to possible exceptions, the key uh, occupations where we really are short, I would say you've just got to take the chance, as you do have to do in life, take the chance and hope you can uh, survive the debt. Sorry, I can't be more helpful. I think hopefully um, people won't do degrees because it became the fact that everybody should go to university and some people are clearly not suited to go to university and I think there was parental pressure uh, for people to go to university who didn't need to. I think what you've got to look at is something for your child that they really want to do. And if it's that you can see that the academic route will be good, that well, then it's worth the three years and what's going to happen, although university courses are going to change. But what I think is going to be very important is can your child, of what, uh, male, female, are they going to be able to earn a living? And I think that's going to be the dominating factor over the next two or three years, not whether you know whether they should go to university or not university is an adjunct professional courses are good all sorts of things are good and if they're a great builder well lots of people will want them but i think at the bottom line will be can they support themselves going forward and you know ongoing could they support a family and i think that sort of thing will become of greater importance i think also the, the question is you know kind of copy dog you know educate each to his own meaning for some kids i think it's been said by other panelists uh, I think it was, it was not a clever idea to try and get everyone into university. Um, and I think really that we've got to look at each individual kid. We have to understand what are their strengths and weaknesses and work out what is best for them. University is not the path for everybody. I said the Jewish community a huge amount of percentage do, um, and that's great. But we have to look at each case and not feel a sense of if our kid we feel will not be right for university. Then know that it's a professional course. It's it's something else. It's an apprenticeship. And we have to just work what's best for our kid. Hello, Ben. Well, as you said, people said it's horses for courses. I think uh, an 18-year-old needs to have some form of education and some form of training. 
uh, and some form of apprenticeship. Uh, that's uh, almost goes without saying. But one of the problems was that I think it was in John Major's time, um, which was supported by uh, Tony Blair, where they felt there has to be an enormous expansion uh, of the university uh, structure. And whereas uh, prior to that, only about 10% of uh, 18-year-olds went to university, it's now over 60%. Uh, and that's obviously too much, and there are far too many university degrees given. I think there is a view, and I know it's held by the university's minister in the Department of uh, Education, and that is that there are the STEM subjects, S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, and medicine, which should have priority uh, for university places. And I'm afraid that a number of the humanities which have uh, burgeoned really over the last few years need to be reassessed uh, because it's becoming increasingly apparent that uh, these courses do not guarantee by any means some form of long-term uh, employment so that there is a, a need for modification uh, and not only as an apprentice but in technical uh, uh, schools as well and I, I think that, that I know there is a a big review, a big government review led by a chap called Philip Orger, who I think uh, was a lawyer. I don't know if Howard uh, knows him. But anyway, who, who's actually reviewing the whole structure of university education because it's now beginning to be appreciated that it perhaps expanded too much. And apart from anything else, it is an extremely expensive uh, form of uh, training as parents will test to. We have a range of questions, so here's a very different one. What should we do for BJ Day this coming weekend to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II? I think number one, if I might say, is to publicise it, because people all know about VE Day, and there have great celebrations for VE Day, but people tend to forget the enormous number of guys that came back um, for VG Day who, who really... Uh, suffered huge deprivation, and they do deserve to be recognised. But um, I'm just uh, conscious of the fact that I, I haven't seen any uh, evidence of this being widely publicised, and I think it's a very good question. I think the problem was that um, the government uh, decided it wouldn't have any um, activities during VE Day because they hoped that we would be able to celebrate the two together by the time VJ Day came. And, of course, there's still problems of having, out, of having events. I think the BBC is covering it, though, this week. It is, there is going to be something. And yeah. the, Duke, the Duke of Edinburgh is going to speak yeah. because he was um, there at the time. So I think it's not being ignored. But the problem is, like a lot of anniversaries this year, B Day, in fact, there was much more of a build-up, as you say, and BJ Day should be celebrated, but it's the fact that with everything else, it's gone rather lower down the line and it's, there are no public celebrations, which I think is very sad. I was totally unaware of BJ Day, um, I'm afraid, which uh, <laughs> perhaps makes an obvious point. Uh, but my instinct is to say that uh, it should at least be uh, noted and uh, even internally celebrated, all the more so, let's get a bit more provocative, all the more so because we're now in a very strange climate of um, antipathy to our old values, what we have achieved, taking also on board what we haven't achieved. Uh, we're getting a very common view that the whole of our history is bad, colonial, racist, etc., etc. And we've got to just perhaps uh, draw a line and just be more uh, aware of our history for better and for worse, but why not have some pride for what we did in the Second World War and the people who came back? Uh, that must be right. What does the Labour Party need to do to attract back its Jewish voters? Removing Jeremy Corbyn was obviously they had to do, had to do that. Whether or not we, we people think that that I mean, there's no way to send in the party, yet. you know, we, we, we see it's still ongoing. Who knows? There's still three or four years to an election, so I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. I think what was remarkable, the, uh, I heard Dame Margaret Hodge uh, speak, and she said that my father couldn't make me Jewish, my rabbi couldn't make me Jewish, but Jeremy Corbyn managed it. And I think that the hurt and the 
the real damage that somebody like him did, I think, can't be underestimated. I mean, the number of clients who actually had lived in this country, they even were not uh, from Holocaust families. I mean, people were seriously had one foot out of this country and were also seriously frightened of what a major English party in this country, um, political party, the damage that could happen, and the fact that whilst he was uh, leader of the party, th um, different things were happening and absolutely institutional anti-Semitism and nothing about it was stopped. And the Labour Party, certainly during the war, was the one you had Manny Shimwell, was the natural home for the Jewish vote. And I think the damage that has been done, I think, will take them many years to get over. I think they've underestimated it, as usual, but I think they really, really did a major job on Jewish society. And people it will take people a long time to recover. Let's not forget that the Labour Party was the main opposition party and also the party of government for some time. Things could change. Jews will go back to the Labour Party when they simply feel confident that they will feel happy and at ease. And let's not delude ourselves that with um, Corbyn gone, the virus has gone. People issue these lovely phrases, we're going to get rid of anti-Semitism. That is a nonsensical phrase. We'll never get rid of anti-Semitism. It's been here for thousands of years, but it is a virus and we can control the virus uh, and not suffer so much from the virus. And we can see already that any hopes that the left will go away and quietly die, the ultra left, that's not happening, is it? I mean, we've seen the most extraordinary uh, vicious comments being made even now. Um, uh, the thing which really got me, just as an example of that, to see the problems that people may have in going back to the Labour Party, if you really want a, a, a sick phrase of the many, there's this um, a professor, and I forget his name at the moment, um, he's a lecturer who's been in the news uh, in, in the last few weeks, and what did he attack? I'm being prompted. David Miller, thank you, my prompter. David Miller, uh, you've all heard of him. Uh, he may not be the worst around, but he certainly got my goat. Well, who did he attack? Of all the people he gave that, he attacked the CST, yeah. the people who've been guarding <laughs> our synagogues, our nurseries, because we're under that. That is the biggest threat, according to him. So that, that's a problem for people who are labor rights. Uh, fine. When they see that that is under control, they'll go back. If it isn't, notwithstanding Keir Starmer, they probably won't. What can our religion teach us about climate change and what action should we take? Andrew, would you like to start with that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, small, easy one. But then the first thing we have to realise is our religion... It, it, no, that's actually a very important point. Judaism suffers from going to extremes. We, we you know, what I call the normative model of orthodoxy, traditional orthodoxy, Zionist orthodoxy, which I think was the mainstay of anglo Jewry for... A good while, and, and you know, we've moved to extremes both left and right in Judaism. The same with climate. You've got people who literally are telling us the world is going to end in nine years unless we give up everything now. Um, and the other side, so I've got people telling me there is nothing, or we need to do nothing, so we can keep doing everything. We need. Again, it's, it's just balance. To me, uh, the Rambam would, would have been giving fantastic shirim about climate change, same with Golden Me. You know, we've got to look and understand, and, and it's, it's like everything. I think. Uh, it was mentioned before, you know, the world today has done so much for climate change in a positive way in terms of what governments are doing, in terms of you know, the British government and many governments to make sure we can have cleaner energy and so on and so forth. But I think if we get pushed to either extreme to kind of say it's all ridiculous, nothing is wrong at all, and the same way to say it's literally when we are killing, you know, I'm not going to quote a certain person, you know, who's told us we're all going to die very quickly and very painfully, you know, it's that's painfully ridiculous. Um, we've got to be calm and we've got to be focused on it. And I know governments are. And again, we can, we can argue to and from about how much, how quickly and so, and so forth. The main thing we have to realise is it, it's got to be a normative sort of balanced approach to sort of, yes, you save the planet, but you destroy every economy in the process. So again, it's, it's all to me, everything in life is about balance. It's the same down the balance now with, with COVID. You know, we can shut down for months and save lives and then destroy everything else. So, again, it's working out how you find that balance. Again, it's not easy. 
But that's the job of government, that's the job of politicians, that's the job of lobby groups, that's the job of us as human beings to work out the, the way forward. But it's certainly somewhere in the middle is the way forward. If anyone wants to raise their hand, I'm going to allow one question um, that hasn't been sent to me. Does anyone want to ask a question? I actually didn't put my hand up. I was trying to touch oh. the screen to see something. Uh, uh, but, but, but wait a minute, I'd like to say one thing, if I may. Uh, whatever, we had a very learned and scholarly all of the answers to the sovereignty, um, you know, Israel's sovereign rights. And you're quite right, it's not annexation, and I don't want to become political. And Natasha Hausdorff did a marvellous job, but I think everybody, I recommend everybody to listen to Brigadier General Yossi Kupavasa. Yossi Kupavasa, Brigadier General. He's going to speak to the Board of Deputies next week. He is in actually there in situ. He knows what's going on. The bottom line is it's very, very necessary for Israel's security. That's all I want to say. Uh, thank you. Carol, I think you had a question. Successive street protests have been carried out and we see the police taking the knee. Do you think that's wise? Um, I think it's just because they want to be seen to be... Uh, not racist in any way, but I also think it undermines the respect for the law. Uh, any comments? This is probably the biggest issue we are going to face in the next generation. There is a massive, massive issue today with virtue signaling, with all these ways we've now decided to live our lives where you cannot offend anybody and so and so forth. The Black Lives Matter uh, organization that has been uh, driving this globally um, has, is a disgraceful organization. I mean, anyone who reads their stuff, you can see it's Marxist, it's anti-Israel, I don't even call, don't even call it anti-Semitic. Um, and again, it, it's, just, it's the same sort of thing. So to me, taking the knee, um, I think actually, I, I, the quote I heard, I think it was from our, one of the government ministers said, I take the knee for God and for my wife, <laughs> or so and so forth. And I actually thought, you know what, well, good on you. And, and what's interesting was that when you looked at the comments of the general public, they applauded him. Because, again, it's the whole thing. This virtue signaling, which is coming from the radical left, they make a lot of noise, a huge amount of noise. But actually, the bog standard individual thinks it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and, and, again, once again, I hope that governments will stop listening to these tiny minorities and realize that most people, and, again, the problem is that younger people tend to be not so sort of uh, um, <laughs> thinking with their with their with their sort of uh, straight and, and common sense and sort of going towards these kind of radical movements. And it is worrying for me. They're raising two young boys, and, and, and we talk a lot about this um, in discussions that are happening in America with the violence and, and how you have the left wing in America condoning the violence. It, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking what's happening. And I think for us as, as, as citizens of this country, I think I'm, I'm, I'm thankful watching American TV, although I live in the UK at the moment. Um, but again, we know that this virus, I think, uh, was used before about everything else that's going on, of this radical left-wing sort of anarchy and Marxism, and so whether it's the BLM or whether it's Antifa, it could spread here, it could spread around the Western world. We've got to be very, very careful to be strong and be proud of our values, our police force. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. Do they make mistakes? Of course they do. Everyone makes mistakes. But to realize that basically we are a sound democracy, a sound country uh, with a proud history that made mistakes, yes but a proud history, and I think we've got to be very careful with this narrative of changing what history is, changing what we've always known. So I think it's a very, very important point that we don't take the knee, but we make sure that there is no racism, and there are not, probably no racism, but we fight against these things, but do it in a, in a position, as Roy said, of normalcy and common sense. The question, Spencer, I think was uh, devoted to police taking the knee, is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, you must remember, you must remember that police have been scarred with the apparently proven allegation that they are institutionally racist. Um, I won't bore everyone by repeating what I've been speaking about for years, uh, trying, like the little you know, the emperor's new clothes, trying to point out that this verdict is grossly unfair, even if you suspect that many police are racist. I'm talking about proven evidence. Uh, McPherson inquiry introduced a concept that you can be racist without knowing that you're racist, uh, given what we have suffered and given what you know, uh, the black community has suffered with the most vicious assaults, murders and all that, getting to academia and talking about can you be labeled a racist 
when you are ignorant and unintentional about it. it it's the most ghastly world that we're in with political correctness. And a lot of the blame must come from uh, those years back from this uh, definition from the McPherson inquiry. So it's hardly surprising when police go out of their way, not lots of bad eggs, but the, most police go out of their way to show that they are sympathetic, empathetic. It doesn't look very convincing to most people. And I think many people feel that they've now got to get control at the same time weeding out bad eggs, fighting real racism, as you and I understand it, but maintaining law and order and taking the knee uh, doesn't do anything to assist that, in my view, quite the contrary. Right, but I think it came out of the murder of George Floyd and it actually came at a time when it was the one of the first things that actually knocked COVID off the news and mm -hmm. went round the world. And I think one, can, again, cannot underestimate in this world when we're looking at gender diversity, pay diversity, ethnic diversity, the answer is we haven't got a very great world and there's a lot of it about. And as I said, when I entered the city, you couldn't get in because you were, you know, there were firms you couldn't go to when, because I was Jewish, there were quotas in different places, and that's not so long ago. So I think that we have to retain an element. It's a very, very uneven society. I think the current situation makes it more uneven. And I think I can see, I would agree that everybody's jumping on the bandwagon on this, which is bad. But I think we have highlighted the fact that what we've got now is not a very good society and it needs to be better. So I think we do need to look at our values. But clearly, unfortunately, certainly in the business world, some of them are not where they ought to be. And I think this is going to be a real feature over the coming years. I belong to a South African firm and it's certainly not going to go away and it's gone right up the agenda. I think how it's tackled is important. And you have to look at things evenly, but there's a lot of unevenness about. So I don't think it's going to go away. Um, Irving, do you want to say anything? I, I agree with most things that people have said. Uh, I think mean, there are two points. First is there is an, a lot of unconscious racism uh, or subconscious racism in, in, in society. And this has been highlighted by the BME uh, revolution, if you like. But this one is not going to go away. It's not something which is uh, a passing phase. And the problem is, as has been mentioned, there are lots of different groups who are jumping on the bandwagon. And because there's become such a, a, a global phenomenon, they see that they now have a platform for all sorts of crazy ideas uh, and which will detract from the underlying message that racism is not acceptable in any shape or form. And, you know, as Jews, I think we all have to accept that. But there is undoubtedly... And a number of studies have shown this uh, amongst society uh, uh, throughout the world of this what's called subconscious uh, racism or subconscious bias. Final question, and I'm asking this because uh, we are an orthodox shul. Uh, so the wrap-up question is, what will happen to religion and belief after the pandemic? And I think we all know what happened after the First World War and the Second World War, and this has been likened to a war. So what do you think will happen to religion and belief after the pandemic? I think we have to also ask ourselves, you know, what is religion um, or what is Judaism? Um, and I think one of the most problematic things about Judaism is that people have always thought of it uh, as a religion, um, like Christianity, like Islam. And of course, it is one of the you know, world's great religions. But Judaism is much more of a way of life. Um, that the, the Torah is meant to be something that's 24-7, uh, not just uh, you know, three times a year, whatever it is. Um, and I think, as I said, that the pandemic has, has really focused us. Um, a lot more people have been attending Shirim on Zoom who maybe wouldn't have gone to shul for Shirim. Uh, I know a lot of people have been going to services who might not have gone to services. Uh, uh, so hopefully there's been a spiritual awakening uh, by people and understand that Judaism is not is there to inspire us, to, to inspire us, to motivate us, to, to connect us more to the world around us, uh, to not to be insular, but to be sort of outgoing, but to take it with us. Uh, and therefore, for, for me, and my hope is that post-pandemic, uh, we take these ideas and we take this enthusiasm and inject it uh, into our daily lives um, for the foreseeable future. Um, there are two ways of looking at it. Do you mean uh, what will happen to religion as a result of the pandemic, or what do you think is going to happen to religion in the future? Uh, I'm not sure if you are uh, either of those or both of those are encompassed, but... 
Well, I, I think the, the, the question really is asking, um, after the world wars, it was difficult getting people back into religious institutions. It took a long time. Uh, yep. it's, people have got used not to going to school at the moment. They found other ways of, uh, and far more people participate now, but it is, a lot of it is online. I heard a webinar recently from a cousin who often struggles for a million, and he got 7,000 people for a Friday night service. Um, so people have changed their habits. Um, how difficult is it going to be to get back to the status quo ante, get people back in the shul and, and get back to the sort of lives they used yeah. to there are people I know who are dying to get back to shore. I don't mean that they're who are, who are really so mad to get back to shore. They really miss it. Um, I'm not like that. Uh, I've never been like that. Uh, I've had problems in shore rather than out of shore. I've had problems because of rabbis and not because of my basic religion. So governing at home with one or two exceptions has been not a hardship at all. Uh, and it's not been a hardship to share my governing area with my wife. Have I been distracted? Yes. Have I managed to govern? Yes, I have. You can, you can, you can manage both. So I think there will be, uh, uh, there will be people who will not be coming back to shul as they did before. They will, to some extent, be able to attend shiurim uh, on Zoom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, shul will not be the same for a very, very long time. The atmosphere will be very different. And just to uh, make sure that people go away slightly annoyed because you've got to think about things. Um, look. One really bad thing uh, of, uh, amongst the many good things that happened. I mean, rabbis have really been putting themselves out to help. Communities have been setting themselves out to help. All good, all good. But I'm one of the minority, well, I, certainly the silent minority, who really despaired when it came to the Sadorin. Because does it really need a layman to tell a rabbi, Andrew, that a Seder service is not like anything else in the year? It is not a night the gathering prayers. It is a night where we have a religious duty to recount the most magnificent historic events in our history. And that historic duty is to be dramatic, to be provocative, to argue, to sing, to entertain. How on earth, how on earth can you do that as a single lone person, an elderly couple, um, without the backgrounds of children and other adults arguing and all the things we've enjoyed over the years. And I do not understand for the life of me why the rabbis, for the most part, were so terrified of allowing people to turn on their computers before the Yom Tov in the week, not touch it, keep it on, and participate in some way. Anything would have been better in a Seder service. And I know, and I'm sure you know, uh, that there were people, Orthodox people, who did that. There's one rabbi who was trained and for a time was a rabbi of United Synagogue in here. He's no longer in the United Kingdom, who had a Zoom Seder with his family. I know for a fact that there were rabbis in parts of London, I won't mention, who told um, a, a, a hunger that they were in favor, but were afraid to speak out. So that's a bad thing, which uh, I just bring that in because this is the, one of the effects of, of the COVID, that we've been stuck at home and for the most part have survived and will survive, but there will be some bad effects. Some people will not be going back to school. That was mighty powerful, Howard, <laughs> at the very end. And it's very good I, I can add to that. I think, uh, like all things in life, once you uh, lose the habit of doing uh, anything, it becomes increasingly difficult to take it up again. And it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Shul numbers, not particularly in, in Edgware, where there's so, such a large proportion of Jewish people, but in, in other communities where, uh, in the provinces where there are small uh, shuls with uh, small congregations, it may well be that this could be a factor in knowing whether or not they are going to exist in the future. I don't know about Andrew, but I'm not. I can judge by the other two. I've actually been back to Shul. Um, we went to Israel because our daughter got married, and we were given a permit, so we went to Shul in Israel. And we have now been to Edgware Adas twice. And uh, last week, um, we managed. I managed to increase the numbers because the week before there were only two women, and this week there were three. Yeah. And I think one goes to Shul for different reasons. And actually, I've been asked why, I was asked on the um, Suda on Shabbos evening, why did you go to shul? And the answer is, because in my personal life, I like structure. And shul gives me that. And when I go, the fact is, uh, the rabbi wasn't there, there wasn't a sermon. But the fact that people come together and want to pray, and I don't think you can underestimate that. I was with one of my clients on Monday, a lawyer, 
and the church isn't open. And actually, they find that a great sadness. So I think you can't underestimate the power of prayer, what you need at the moment. And everybody needs something different, which I can understand. But I think actually faith may well be strengthened. The other thing, and I think Howard had mentioned, which is right, during all this, I think the Rabonim, the different shuls, lay people have done the most tremendous amount of work. You can have a Friday night service before Shabbos, and I think that has been beneficial. I think in this current time, people need something. And I think, like everything else, like you asked before about medical opinions going online, I think the established faiths are going to have to react differently in the future to what people want. But I don't think faith and religion will disappear, and I think more people will be attracted to it. Thank you. Our next session is on Tuesday, the 8th of September, 8 o'clock, when Rabbi Jeffrey Schisler will present as part of the United Synagogue's 150th anniversary celebration, um, a celebration of the United Synagogue's cantorial tradition, a tribute to its chazanim, 1870 to 2020, their lives and their music. And I think it's a particularly good time to be holding it just before Rosh Hashanah for those people who actually can't get to shore. Uh, you can find full details of this on the HOA US website. And remember, many of our past sessions can be found on the HOA US YouTube channel. It remains for me to thank our four panelists for an enlightening and entertaining session. Uh, we've got through a huge range of questions. There's been a very high level of discussion. And I hope that we can repeat this at some future time.